Hi, I'm Dan Rockmore, director of the William H. Newcomb Institute for Computational Science here at Dartmouth College. And on behalf of the college and the Newcomb Institute, I'd like to welcome you to this year's Fall Donahoe Colloquium, the cross-partisan challenge uh, from Professor Lawrence Lessig of Harvard University. Uh, the Donahoe Colloquium is an ongoing series of public lectures aimed at increasing awareness of the many important and sometimes surprising places in which computational ideas are shaping our lives. These events are made possible by a generous gift from David, Mickey, and Dan Donahoe in honor of Dan's graduation as a member of the class of 2006. It's a central piece of the larger mission of the Newcomb Institute, whose aim is to support and to integrate computational thinking and computational ideas throughout the Dartmouth community. The Institute itself is made possible through the generosity of Bill Newcomb, Dartmouth class of 64, and a former trustee of the college. The projects and ideas supported by the Newcomb Institute are computational in nature or in spirit, or sometimes both, and they span the spectrum of human interests. They come from and bridge the arts and humanities, medicine, the sciences, and the social sciences. They inform policy making and they enable efforts in social justice. But it's not only the explicit or, one, or what one might call the foregrounded outputs of the digital that are of interest. Arguably, even more significant are the ways in which thinking about our ever-changing digital world can lead us to reconsider the underlying background against which these new ideas are developed. Now, I'll confess that I hijacked this background foreground language from a recent New Yorker profile of this afternoon's speaker. Uh, in it, Professor Lessig is quoted as saying, quote, I sometimes think that everything I've done has been about how context matters, the background, not the foreground. In the words of that profile, Lawrence Lessig is among America's most influential theorists on the intersection of law, culture, and the internet. But that's only part of it. Lawrence has in fact made a life of seamlessly and relentlessly moving between academia and activism so as to enable us to realize the extraordinary potential for social and creative transformation embedded in the digital environment and society as a whole. As many of you know, Professor Lessig is co-founder of the Creative Commons, which makes possible the attachment to creative products, a form of copyright, better suited for our networked and digital world. It takes on the problem of remaking the relevant legal structures to better fit the realities and possibilities of today. The vision statement for the Creative Commons is particularly illuminating. It reads in part, quote, our vision is nothing less than realizing the full potential of the internet, universal access to research and education, full participation in culture, to drive a new era of development, growth, and productivity, end quote. Taking, to its logic, taking it to its logical conclusion, the goal of full, particip of full participation, not just in culture, but the society as a whole, in conjunction with internet-inspired ideas such as crowdsourcing, this suggests the path from the Creative Commons to Professor Lessig's most recent forms of collective action, such as the Root Strikers Organization and the May Day Political Action Committee. And it brings us to the subject of Professor Lessig's lecture today. Lawrence Lessig holds a BA in Economics and a BS in Management from the University of Pennsylvania, an MA in Philosophy from Cambridge, and a JD from Yale. He's now the Roy L. Furman Professor of Law at Harvard Law School and director of the Edmund J. Safra Center for Ethics at Harvard University. Prior to rejoining the Harvard faculty, Professor Lessig was a professor at Stanford Law School where he founded the school's Center for Internet and Society and at the University of Chicago. He clerked for Judge Richard Posner on the Seventh Circuit of Appeals and Justice Antonin Scalia on the US Supreme Court. Professor Lessig still serves on the board of Creative Commons and is, on other, and is on various other boards, including the Sunlight Foundation, whose mission is to promote openness in government. He's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the American Philosophical Association, and has received numerous awards, including the Free Software Foundation's Freedom Award, Fast Case 50 Award, and being named one of Scientific American's top 50 visionaries. In addition to his many essays and articles, he's the author of a number of well-received books, including Free Culture, which was listed among the best books of 2004 by Business Week, and most recently, Republic Lost. I was happy to discover that both of these books are in fact fully available for free online under a Creative <laughs> Commons license. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming our fall 2015 Donahoe Colloquium lecturer, Professor Lawrence Lessig.
Thank you, and it's wonderful to be here. It's wonderful to be here in the Newcomb Center. I knew Bill uh, Newcomb many years ago when I was pulled into the middle of the Microsoft case. <clears throat> I was not a favored participant in the Microsoft case from Microsoft's perspective. They worked hard <laughs> to get me removed from the case. Uh, but the battle at the time was its own kind of partisan challenge because what they charged me with was the great sin of using a Macintosh computer, which of course marked me as a crazy radical, not qualified to serve as a special master in the case. But I had extraordinarily warm and generous exchanges with Bill for many years after that, and then I had the honor of teaching his son when his son was a student at Stanford. And so I'm very happy to be back here to continue a conversation that I hope um, is as respectful and edifying as any that I've had with Bill before. Now, the question I want to talk to you about, I want to introduce with a little bit of context, not in the background, but in a different continent. I'm sure many of you still remember the days before Ebola when there were these protests people were focused on in the Hong Kong district. Protests where thousands of students and then hundreds of thousands of Hong Kong residents turned out to criticize Hong Kong's proposed method for selecting their governor, their chief executive. As 2007's promise from China was that by 2017, Hong Kong would be able to elect its chief executive. At the end of August, China specified the procedure by which that chief executive would be selected. And what Hong Kong was told was, quote, the ultimate aim is the selection of the chief executive by universal suffrage upon nomination by a broadly representative nominating committee in accordance with democratic procedures. Now that nominating committee was to be about 1,200 Hong Kong residents, which means about 0.024% of Hong Kong, got to sit on the committee that would ultimately select the candidates who got to run in the election to be governor. So Hong Kong's democracy looks like this. There would be an election where all citizens get to vote, but before the election, there's a nominating process where the 1,200 got to vote. You had to do well in the nominating process to be able to run in the election, a two-stage process with a filter at the first stage. Now, it's this structure that triggered the strike throughout Hong Kong, because as many said, this 1,200 was going to be dominated by a pro-Beijing business and political elite. In the words of Martin Lee, chairman of the Hong Kong Democratic Party, quote, we want genuine universal suffrage, not democracy with Chinese characteristics. Okay, that last phrase is the one that triggered my interest in this story. Because the question is, is this really a democracy with Chinese characteristics? And I think the answer is, it isn't, unless Boss Tweed was an ancient Chinese prophet. <laughs> Because as Boss Tweed said, I don't care who do, does the electing as long as I get to do the nominating. <laughs> now we could call such a structure Tweedism. And we can say of Hong Kong's structure, it's a perfect exemplar of Tweedism. But I want to think a little bit about Tweedism in America. First think, for example, about the Old South. In 1870, the United States did what literally almost no one 10 years thought, 10 years before, thought it would do. It passed an amendment to its constitution that said the right to vote could not be denied on the basis of race. Now when they passed that amendment, there were many who hoped the future would look something like this, but in fact the future looked quite different as there was a concerted effort for 100 years, okay, that's a little exaggerated, for 95 years, a concerted effort to exclude African-Americans from the right to vote. 
no place more ambitiously than the great state of Texas, which by law enacted an all-white primary that explicitly said African Americans could not vote in the Democratic primary. So in the Old South, there was a two-step democracy too. There was a general election where all citizens presumptively had the right to vote. But first there was a white primary where only whites got to vote. You had to do well in the white primary to be able to run in the general election, a two-stage process with a filter at the first stage, which excluded in this critical first step a significant portion, 12 to 14 percent of the population. And the consequence, of course, obviously, was to produce a democracy responsive to whites only. This is an example of tweedism. Okay, but it's the second example that's the focus of my talk. Think about democracy in New America, not the Old South. We take it for granted in America that campaigns will be privately financed. And we recognize, especially today, that the funding of campaigns is an essential step on the way to being elected to Congress or to any other major office. And so we can think about this funding as a kind of nominating, or think about the funders as the nominators. So once again, you could say we have a two-step process. In the first step, the funders of campaigns get to vote, and in the second step, the citizens get to vote in the actual election. So think a little bit about this relationship between the funders and members of Congress. As this system has evolved, members of Congress and candidates for Congress spend anywhere between 30 to 70 percent of their time raising money to get into Congress or to get their party back into power. As they spend their time dialing for dollars, they learn something. They learn what they must do in order to get the support they need. B.S. Skinner, Skinner gave us this image of the Skinner box, where any stupid animal could learn which buttons it needed to push to get the sustenance it needs. This is a picture of the modern American congressperson. <laughs> As the modern American congressperson learns through this osmosis which buttons need to be pushed to get the sustenance his or her campaigns need. As they do this, as any of us would, they develop a sixth sense a constant awareness about how what they do will affect their ability to raise money. They become, in the words of the X-Files, shape shifters, as they constantly adjust their views in light of what they know will help them to raise money, not in issues 1 to 10, but in issues 11 to 1,000. Leslie Byrne, a Democrat from Virginia, describes that when she went to Congress, she was told by a colleague, quote, always lean to the green. Then to clarify, she went on, he was not an environmentalist. <laughs> So when we think about this tight relationship between the funders and the members, we need to ask ourselves the question, who are the funders? Who are the people who are giving enough to, be, to matter to the candidates? Who are the ones who give enough so that their views are in the minds of the candidates as the candidates call them? And the answer is, in the research I did for my book, Republic Lost, it's no more than about 0.05% of America are the relevant funders of campaigns. That's about 150,000 Americans, which the internet tells me is the same number of people as are named Lester in the United States, <laughs> which is why I called my TED talk Lesterland, <laughs> describing the democracy of the United States. And after the Supreme Court's decision in McCutcheon versus the FEC just this year, that number will fall, I think, to no more, no more than about 35,000 relevant funders which the internet tells me is the same number of people as her name Sheldon in the United States. <laughs> or think about the DC Circuit's decision in Speech Now, which created the Super PAC. In 2012, there were 132 Americans who gave 60% of the Super PAC money that was, elect that was spent in that election cycle. 132, which is about the same number of people as are named Adolf in the United States. So the point is, whether it's Lester Land or Sheldon City or Adolphia, it is a tiny, tiny fraction of the 1% who are dominating this first stage of our election. So we, too, have this two-stage process. We have a general election where all citizens get to vote, but we also have a green primary 
where the relevant funders get to vote. And you must do well in the green primary in order to run in the general election. You don't necessarily have to win. There are people like Jerry Brown who are able to win without getting the most money, but in 94% of the cases, the person with the most money wins. This is the picture of democracy in America. And this time, it's a majority who are excluded from the first st critical first stage. They're not totally excluded from our election process, of course. The Supreme Court was right in Citizens United. The people have the ultimate influence over the elected officials because, after all, there is a general election. But the people have that influence only after the funders have had their way with the candidates who wish to run in that general election. And the consequence, then, of this two-stage process is a democracy responsive to the funders only. I cite some Princeton research, which I'm not supposed to do, so let me push that quickly off the stage here, <laughs> by Martin Gillens and Ben Page, just published this fall. The largest empirical study of policy decisions by our government in the history of political science, tracking the relationship between what our government actually did and the attitudes of the economic elite organized business interests, and the average voter. So economic elites, as you go from the left to the right, you see an increasing in the percentage of the economic elite who support a certain policy. And what that graph is showing you is as more support the policy, the probability of it being enacted goes up. So as 100% support the policy, then the probability comes to 0.7 that that policy will actually be enacted. Similar for interest group alignments. As more support the policy, you see the probability of the policy being enacted going up. But here's the graph for the average American voter. Flatlined. Flatlined. What that says is, no matter what the, prob the percentage of average voters who support a policy, the probability that the policy will be adopted doesn't change. Doesn't change. Unless we happen, average voters happen to agree with what the economic elite or the organized business interests want, what we want doesn't matter as they summarize the research, when the preferences of the economic elites and the stands of organized interest groups are controlled for, the preferences of the average American appear to have only a minuscule, near zero, statistically non-significant impact on public policy. This is the picture <laughs> of democracy in America. This is tweetism too. And it is just as extreme as the story from Hong Kong. Because remember in Hong Kong I said it was 0.024% of Hong Kong who constituted the nominating committee. Well, if you look at the number of Americans who give $2,500 or more, the 0.05%, that's a little bit more, but the number of people who give $10,000 or more is just 0.01%. So you tell me where you think the relevant cutoff should be. My point is it's pretty close to what we all feel confident we can say is not a democracy when it happens in Hong Kong, but we feel a little bit reluctant to say of the democracy here. It is just as extreme and I think just as wrong. Okay, That's tweetism, but what does tweetism do? Well, again, in Hong Kong, we really don't know yet, because we don't have it there yet, but the fear is that there are two systems, their promise of two systems will merge into one, and that the true, any true democracy or any ideal of a true democracy will disappear. In the Old South, what Tweedism did was to encourage an incredible oppression. If you remember this, this film, um, uh, Awakenings, which was the story of the drug El Dopo, which was given to people who had gotten encephalitis during the 
1917 to 1928 period uh, where the F epidemic of encephalitis happened. And the encephalitis that they got put them into a catatonic state. And this drug, L-DOPA, woke them up. And so this is amazing dynamic of people 40 years after they'd fallen into a catatonic state being woken up. But then the tragedy of the story is that the drug eventually lost its effect. And so these people who woke up after 40 years slowly fell back into a catatonic state, recognizing that they were falling back into a catatonic state, this terror of realizing that they were going to be locked up again. That is a perfect metaphor for what happened to African Americans in our democracy. Because immediately after the Civil War, there was an extraordinary awakening of political participation by African Americans. These were the original representatives from the 41st and 42nd Congress, African Americans who served in Congress, elected to Congress through what seemed to be fair and representative systems. But slowly, the democracy closed that opportunity down. And so African Americans watched, just like those patients watched, themselves fall back into this politically catatonic state until as Robert Caro could describe in 1957, an African American trying to vote would face, for example, something like this. They would have to qualify to vote. And so here's one of the descriptions of that qualifications. The questions were often on the hard side. Name all of Alabama's 67 county judges. What was the date Oklahoma was admitted to the union? And sometimes very hard indeed, how many bubbles in a bar of soap? These were the questions an African American had to answer because he wasn't qualified by the grandfather clause in order to be entitled to register to vote in the South in 1957. So the life of African Americans under Tweedism was a life of increased oppression. It was a, quote, democracy for them, totally unresponsive to blacks because blacks were just not a part of that democracy. And then in New America, there are two effects of Tweedism. Number one, this is the democracy unresponsive to the average voter. That's the point of the Princeton study. But the point to recognize is it's true whether you're a Republican or a Democrat. It is unresponsive to you whether your views are on the right or on the left. This is a perfectly nonpartisan unresponsiveness. <laughs> And you might say, hooray, finally, something nonpartisan. <laughs> but you should say, terrible, it's unresponsiveness that is being nonpartisan here. It is nonresponsive to us regardless of our political persuasion. And number two, it is unresponsive, period. It is incapable of responding, period, the way the system has evolved. This is Francis Fukuyama who's in Reese's most recent book, The Political Order and Political Decay, describes what he considers the American democracy to be. He says, it's not really a democracy, not an aristocracy, not a plutocracy, not even a kleptocracy. What America has become is a vetoocracy, a vetocracy. And what he attributes it to is something the framers gave us, the system of checks and balances, plus the evolution to this incredibly polarized political culture. And those two things produce what he describes as this disaster for governance because it's trivially simple, he says, to stop any reform, whether it comes from the left or from the right. Now, I think his description is true, but it's incomplete. You have to add to that description one further element, the role of money in politics. Because that dynamic, exacerbates the problem of polarization and checks and balances. Because the framers of our government, of course, didn't give us a democracy, not a pure democracy. They gave us a complicated democracy. They were kind of the Swiss watchmakers of constitutional design. Very intricate system for balancing influences so that when our Congress did something, at least you were confident it represented a significant majority. But imagine now pouring some honey right down into the middle of that complicated Swiss watch-like design, because that is precisely the effect of this system of funding 
elections. Because when you have a system where such a tiny, tiny number every, uh, exercise such incredible control over the funding in that first critical stage of the election, what that means is that a tiny fraction of that tiny number, and I mean really, really tiny here, tiny, tiny number, have the power to block reform. They can leverage their funding influence to block the reform, which means that change, really any change, whether it comes from the left or right, will fail. So I don't care what your issue is, whether it's climate change or tax reform or the debt or financial reform, whatever your issue is. What this vitocracy means is that the change to make that reform possible cannot happen given the way we fund campaigns, which means until we change how campaigns are funded, sane policy here is just not possible. We are like the bus driver who has lost the steering wheel from his bus, incapable of steering regardless of the direction. So again, we can say it's not just the fact that policy doesn't track what the average voter wants, that's the Princeton point. Just as important is that sane policy, regardless of its source, will fail. This is what tweetism in America does. It is what democracy in America and corruption in America is. Okay, now, what can be done about this problem? At an institute like this, the natural instinct is to embrace the idea that the internet is going to have an important role in fixing this problem. And my view is, yes, that's true. But can it fix the particular flavor of this problem as it relates to the polarization of our political culture? And to answer that, I want to shift a little bit and talk a little bit about something from the theory of the way the internet has developed in society. Or you could say, I'm going to tell you about something that is... And now for something completely different. Completely different. So this man is Dan Bricklin. Dan Bricklin is the inventor of VisiCalc, which of course was the first spreadsheet which made um, the nature of the PC essential to all business across America. And Dan Bricklin wrote this incredible piece in mid-2000s, Cornucopia of the Commons. And this was a piece about Napster. You might remember Napster, the service that enabled people to get music for free. And what he was responding to, Bricklin, was a certain attitude that existed in the internet culture about Napster and what Napster represented. So um, um, uh, my friend Corey wrote about Napster and said, Napster represented the largest library of human creativity ever assembled. And he romanticized the idea that humans had come together to build this amazing <laughs> cultural archive in this kind of social communist like So and what Brooklyn says is, it's total mess that there's nothing romantic about what happened with Napster. No altruistic sharing motives needed to be present to explain what happened with Napster. Because the public good that was produced, this incredible archive of music that people could get access to for free, the largest library of human creativity ever assembled, was a byproduct, a byproduct of giving people what they wanted. Because what Napster did, the default in the way Napster was produced, was to say that any music you had in your library was automatically shared with anybody else on the internet. You didn't choose that, that was just the default. And so what that means is that default is the thing that produced the public good, the design of the product, not some desire of individuals across the internet to work to the common good of building some huge archive of music. No altruistic sharing motives need to be present to explain how Napster produced this extraordinary resource for all of us to share. 
And Bricklin goes on to say it's the same with basically every single interesting internet phenomenon. So CDDB server was a server where if you put your CD into your computer, it would automatically identify the songs on that CD and tell you who produced the songs and all this interesting information. This too was produced in the same way, not by people volunteering all their effort to produce this huge database, but because as they tried to get access to information about their music, they would make that information available to others as well. The designer of this, Evan Williams, uh, put it, we want to design the database so people use the data they enter, thus increasing their incentive to get it right. And as they get it right, it made it available for everybody else. And Evan Williams went on to invent Twitter. He's the person behind Twitter. So he has a pretty good idea about how to get people to do things that produce enormous value, at least for him. So here we have a public good, which is just a byproduct of this private good. That's the point that Dan Bricklin was trying to make. And what that point raises is a pretty fundamental question. Can reform be a byproduct? Can the kind of reform that the problem that I've described be a byproduct of giving people something that they want on the internet? Can we use the internet in some way to motivate people to support this idea of reform? Now, there's lots of reasons for hope. You know, all sorts of things that go on in the internet that get people incredibly excited, and we think we're going to have a revolution just around the corner because of what the internet's enabled. So there's lots of reasons, yes, to be hopeful about this. And I've participated in this song fest for hope. So last year, almost a year ago exactly, I posted on my blog this idea of organizing a march across New Hampshire in January. OK, objectively, the craziest idea you could possibly have. But I said, let's try to organize a march across New Hampshire in January. This was behind something called the New Hampshire Rebellion. And what we said was, in order to support a movement for reform, we were going to start in Dixville Notch and watch all the way down to Nashua. 190 miles, um, rallying people to this idea of reform. Totally crazy, just posted on a blog. But in fact, on January 11th, a bunch of us started, more than 200 participated, and by two weeks later, we were in Nashua, a total of 220 having participated, we crossed, 207 having participated, um, having 20 people who do every single mile Youngest people walking were 10-year-olds. The coldest place was the capital. That's not surprising, perhaps. 10,000 people recruited to the New Hampshire Rebellion, all of it out of a simple call from people across the country to rally as the internet made it possible. And after doing that crazy thing, then I had the idea to do a second crazy thing. In March, I announced at this TED Talk we were going to do this thing called May Day a super PAC to end all super PACs. We launched it on May Day, kind of double meanings to get you to think a little bit about what it is. But what it means is May Day for our democracy, meaning we need to call a May Day on this democracy. And the idea behind May Day was that we were going to find a way to elect a Congress committed to fundamental reform by 2016. How are we going to fund it? Well, in the first cycle, I said we just kickstart it, which means we would crowdfund it. So sort of kickstart, because you can't use kickstart for politics. But the idea is we'd raise half of it from the bottom up, and then we'd get that half matched from the top down. So we succeeded in crowdfunding $6 million. We said we'd raise a $1 million in 30 days. We did that in 13 days. Then we said we'd raise $5 million in 30 days. We raised that exactly on the 30th day, which was July 4th at 9 PM. Just as the fireworks were breaking out all across the East Coast, we crossed the $5 million mark. And then we got most of that match. So we're now at about $10.5 million, an incredible effort to fund the experiment of trying to demonstrate people care enough about this issue to elect people who will vote for reform. That kind of example plus thousands of examples give us hope that the internet is a platform that would make this kind of change possible. 
But here's the fear. The internet is creating what we could think of as exopolitics, exo as in external to the political system, supports the political system, but kind of on the outside. But the problem with this exopolitics is it is polarized. Just like everyone, like politicians, political parties, the media, the dot orgs, the exopolitics of the internet practices this business model of polarization. Business model of polarization, which means they profit, we profit, the more we divide, the more one side can teach their side to hate the other side, the more profitable it is for that one side, the more easy it is for that one side to grow. So we're kind of this polarized culture, so polarized but very cool. That's the way the internet has developed and exacerbated the polarization that exists already within our political society. Now that is a problem because with the sort of changes that we need to bring about to deal with this fundamental corruption in the way our government works, polarized will fail. If we're gonna take on this cancer which is DC, it must be through a cross-partisan movement, not a bipartisan movement, but a movement that cuts across partisan lines. A movement that doesn't require you to believe that you have to be a Democrat to support this or you have to be a Republican to support this. That instead allows you to believe that it doesn't matter whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, you can support and ought to support reform. We cannot win this fight if it's in a polarized frame and that polarized frame is what it seems to be in right now. Okay, so that's a fact about how we get reform. Let's bring back Dan Bricklin for a second. If this story of the cornucopia of the commons is possible, is it possible to imagine the cornucopia uniting us, bringing us together rather than forcing us apart? And the problem is when you think about the mechanism of internet activism, this kind of grassroots, ground up, peer-to-peer -peer activism, all that's exciting and lots of activity that it makes manifest, but if in fact we get public goods as a byproduct of private goods, if that's what Dan Bricklin has taught us, the byproduct here is produced by people sharing with each other what they like. But what does that mean? That means people are rallying people like them. <laughs> They're rallying people like them to their cause, which means people at my political poll get rallied together and people at your political poll get rallied together. But the rallying is not bringing us together. It's just reinforcing our separation. And what that means is that the internet is not going to function as a solution to polarization, at least the way we've seen it develop so far. And so the question is, is there a way to imagine it? Can we imagine depolarization as a byproduct? And the truth is, I'm not sure how. I mean, there's a certain commitment that's required here. Not just getting what you like. It's a commitment to do things that are uncomfortable, what feel unnatural, to act with a certain kind of risk, the risk that what you say or do produces an unlike from another friend or a defriend from another person, that you act in a way that tries to bring people together, but in a context where that feels incredibly uncomfortable. There's some who've begun to suggest that there are ways to do that. This research just literally published this week suggests that there's a way that social media can reduce polarization. But I think we have to say that it's not clear. It's not clear that the internets have ever done this. It's not clear how they could do this, given the Bricklin point that the most important things the internet have done have been basically giving us what we want and then celebrating the byproduct, the public good that's a byproduct of that. Okay, 
So how do we take that depressing point and put it to some good use? So that's what I'm going to do in this last section here. So we don't know how we're going to get there, but here are the first steps. Here's the first steps. If you remember back to the civil rights movement, there was an important battle between two different sections of the civil rights movement. There was a kind of Malcolm X perspective to the civil rights movement, and there was a Dr. Martin Luther King perspective to the civil rights movement. And what Malcolm X said was it was critically important to rally African Americans to the cause of civil rights. And the best way to rally them was to get them angry, to get them furious with the existing system. And if that produced violence, then so what? Violence was a byproduct of a violent system. And Martin Luther King's approach was exactly the opposite. King's approach was, we have to find a way to bring others into this movement. We have to, as he said, speak so that others can hear us. Now, when we look back on this history, we kind of think that King was the one who was right because King's version ultimately facilitated what was the successful civil rights movement in the 1960s. But I think we should recognize, in some sense, both were right. We had to both motivate people to try to bring about change and then engage them so that they would bring about the right kind of change. And I think that's true here, too. When we think about this corruption, that has stopped our government from having the capacity to govern, I think we have to find a way to motivate people to want to be involved in fixing it. And we have to find a way to engage people in the project of fixing it. And the engaging process is the one which everyone in this audience is capable of participating in because the engaging process is about a certain discipline. It's about speaking about this problem in a way that allows other people to hear so that other people can listen to you and understand what you're saying. Because in a world divided by politics embracing these two extremes, what we need is a frame that allows both sides to hear and that doesn't force either side to run away. And the truth is that we know from the polling that we've done on this subject for the last five years, the single most effective frame for getting people to talk about this issue in a common way is to speak about a common recognition of the corruption that has evolved within the way our government functions. The corruption that is produced by the tweedism that I've just described, the corruption which exists in any system where a tiny, tiny fraction have such enormous influence over the way the democracy works. That corruption is not a democratic or a republican issue. That corruption is an American issue. And we have to recognize that before we were Democrats or Republicans, before we became either of those two identities, we were citizens first. Citizens who have an obligation not to a party, but who have an obligation to a democracy. And when we can engage people in that way and get them to connect first here as citizens, it makes it possible to get them to engage in this problem of finding a reform to this democracy. But then the more important problem then is motivating. Motivating people to participate. Because the truth is, Malcolm, easy, Malcolm X had it easy. It's pretty easy to motivate African Americans to be concerned about the inequality that they were suffering. It was obvious and they felt it in everything they did. But it's pretty hard to motivate people to care about this corruption because it feels so removed, it feels so impossible. We've kind of resigned ourselves to the reality of a government that is corrupt. We did a poll last year where we found 96% 
of Americans believed it important to reduce the influence of money in politics, but 91% said it wasn't possible. So 96 and 91 together is the politics of resignation. We accept there are three truths about our life. One is death, the other is taxes, and the third is a corrupt form of government. <laughs> so it is hard to think about how we can motivate people. But the more I've thought about where this motivation comes from, I recognize that the way to motivate is to think about why this matters, or more precisely, to whom does this matter? And the answer is it matters to a tiny minority in this audience most. What it matters to most is you, as in you kids. Now, there are some who like aspire to be kids in this audience, so let's just talk to them in this really kid-like way for a second. But here's the point. If you think about all of the problems that we identify as the biggest problems our nation faces, <coughs> these are problems for our kids first. So climate change. We're wrecking our climate. All of us, most of us, have finally come to recognize this. When we walked across New Hampshire, even in the north of New Hampshire, Tea Party country, people would tell us about the moose who would walk out of the forest covered in ticks, sucked to death because these ticks had millions of them taken them over. And why were there ticks on their bodies? Because the temperature never fell enough to freeze the ticks. So this was radically changing the way the, uh, the ecology was developing in the north. We're all slowly coming to recognize this fact about our climate. But for those of us over 50, the truth is it's not going to matter that much. I mean, we'll hear about it. Al Gore will parade around about it for the next 20 years. No doubt it will be an issue we talk about, but it's not going to matter that much for us. The real burden of climate change is going to be for them. We're thinking about the debt. We've literally lost the political capacity to deal with the problem of the debt, either by reducing spending or increasing taxes. Either way, we don't have that political capacity anymore. We are literally borrowing money from our kids. Now, that's good for us. <laughs> Thank you to those children for that great gift they're giving back to us, but it's not great for them. We're thinking about the healthcare system. We have a system that because of the policy gifts to pharmaceutical companies, the policy gifts to insurance companies, costs too much but delivers way too little. Yet, again, for those of us over 50, we'll be okay for the next 20, 30, or 40 years. It'll still be puttering along. We'll find ways to pay for it. The real burden of this policy insanity is a burden that falls on them. Or think finally about an economy, an economy that has lost the capacity to grow in a way that rewards people across the economic spectrum in any equal way at all. It grows in a way that benefits the very, very top and not at all the middle or lower classes. This is a problem, of course, not so much to be felt by people in their retirement. This is a problem that will be felt by them. And when these kids recognize that the dynamic of American politics to them is an us versus you, us, those of us 50 or over, versus you, these kids who will suffer because we have lost the capacity to govern, they will increasingly be motivated to do something in response. Now, the truth is, we're not evil here, those of us 50 or over. We're just pathetic, <laughs> pathetic. We're not actively taking something from our kids. We're just sitting by and doing nothing as this corruption corrupts the ability of our government to deal with these issues that are fundamentally critical for our kids. We're not Nazis in this story. We're the good Germans in this story who sit by passively as a real wrong happens that we all recognize is wrong, and yet we do not stop. We need to recognize the harm we do, and we need to find a way to work with them, with the youth, because it's you, as in the youth, who are going to have to save the youth. It is that political movement that will motivate. 
And that brings me back to the story that I started with. Because that's the incredible story in Hong Kong. It's not that there was a protest of hundreds of thousands of citizens. It was that it was a protest begun by students, literally children. There were kindergarten children who were sitting in protest in the streets of Hong Kong. And eventually their parents felt guilty that it was the kids protesting for a true democracy that brought the parents out to produce the hundreds of thousands who were protesting. So the question here is not, why are they protesting? It seems pretty obvious. They want a democracy, and they know what they have to fight in order to get it. The real question is, why aren't they, as, our, as in our kids, protesting? Or why aren't you protesting against the structure that denies to us the democracy that we were promised? Now, I've spent many years, now eight years, trying to rally my kind to this cause. My kind meaning most of you, meaning those of us who remember the 1960s. My kind. But the more I think about this, the more I recognize that our only real hope here is that if we can find a way to rally not us, but them, our kids, and this is the moral charge for us. Because the moral question of our time is can we reclaim a democracy? Not for us. We've had our time. In some sense, we've wasted what we were given. This is the moral question of our time because now is the moment that we have to find a way to restore to them what we were given, a democracy, which they now do not have. Thank you very much. sense protest is a luxury until it's a necessity and a lot of people are too busy making ends meet to actually think about the abstract root causes of their trouble they're too busy busy addressing the um, the immediate causes so wouldn't it be a good motivating uh, move to to draw more connections between the corruption and the everyday troubles that an average American is facing it's absolutely the case people have to see the connection um, but in fact, what we know from research that we've done is that people do see the, see the connection today more than ever. Um, and the problem isn't so much recognizing the dynamic that is producing the failure of our government to work. It's believing there's anything they can do about it, believing there's some reason to try to step up and do something about it. And again, I think this relates to um, you know, what it is to grow up. Like at, at our age, my age, now I'm not speaking for you, my age, you know, we kind of learned, this is the way the world is, what are you gonna do? But if you're 18 or 20 or 22, you haven't yet learned, <laughs> you don't yet know enough to know this is the way things have to be. And that's the ignorance, that is the opportunity here. Because if you can get people to see the injustice, and believe that there's something that can be done, I think there's a way to motivate them. There's an incredible contradiction in, in this case that as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a group, we have less agency than we might have had before. But a single person has never before had this much agency, partly thanks to the internet. So that, that, would, that is a hope. Yeah, but then, again, then the question is, what's the agency for? And this is why I introduced this problem of what Dan Bricklin was talking about. 
If it's an agency for giving us what we already want, that's great. But the problem here is getting people to work for something they don't obviously want directly, or it seems a little too abstract, or it's harder to motivate. That's, that's the challenge of you know, an older time. How do you rally people to stand up and do something that's hard? Not how do you get them to sit at a computer and click on the likes of the places that they want to go. You were at one point were a law clerk for um, Scalia, and it appears that the Supreme Court is, is not helping your cause. I mean, it is loud, you know, big interests, big financial interests to put more, more, more money in, and yet it's also allowing restrictions on voting rights. Uh, any thoughts? So I actually think the Supreme Court has been the biggest gift to this movement in the last 50 years. In just the way, I'm pro-choice, but let me say, in just the way that Roe versus Wade was the biggest gift to the pro-life movement in the history of the pro-life movement. And so the reason is that decision, Citizens United and other related decisions, has so outraged people about the role of money in politics, people on the left and the right, that finally it's possible to begin to get people like this <laughs> in a room to talk about it. I can guarantee you 10 years ago, Nobody would want to talk about this issue. It just you know, seemed to, you know, way too abstract. Now it's just abstract, right? But, but the point is the court has helped us see how incredibly important and, and, and urgent it is to do something about it. So that's been a good thing the Supreme Court has done. And number two, the solution to this problem has nothing to do with the Supreme Court. Right? So if the problem as I've described it, problem of tweedism, is that there's a tiny, tiny number who are funding elections. The only way to fix that is to change the way we fund elections. And to change the way we fund elections requires a statute. It doesn't require a decision by the Supreme Court. And all of the most prominent ways to change the way we fund elections, for example, Government by the People Act is proposed by a guy named John Sarbanes would give matching grants to small contributions. So if you give $100, it's worth $1,000 to the campaign. Or Jim Rubens ran in this state, the Republican ran in the Republican primary, supporting a voucher proposal where every voter would get a voucher that they would use to fund campaigns. Both of those systems would radically increase the number of relevant funders of campaigns, but neither of those two changes could be brought about by the Supreme Court. They have to be brought about by legislatures who would enact those types of reforms. And if they enacted either of those two reforms, the Supreme Court would, see, would not begin to stop, do anything to stop it. These, those reforms are perfectly constitutional according to the Supreme Court. So I agree with you, the Supreme Court has made some very bad blunders. But I believe those blunders have helped us build the beginnings of a movement to do something about it. And those blunders will not stop us from making the most important change necessary, namely bringing about the change in the way we fund elections. Thank you. Um, I hope you can clear something up for me. I see your point about vetoocracy and how the ease of preventing change makes it very difficult to cause change. That's easy. And I see your point about the underrepresentation of voters in the way that we nominate by funding our elected representatives. Can you speak more about the connection between the two? That is, how does this tiny, tiny portion of America picking nominees create vetoocracy and create stagnation where we know there are conservative super PACs and liberal super PACs, and both parties at least have roughly equally magnitude funding. So it would not appear that one side is benefiting from this, and maybe this is where you were talking about how it's partisan neutral. Can you talk about how yeah. our nomination process creates Stagnancy. Yeah, great question. So it looks like we've got political power on both sides. David Brooks' recent column in the New York Times kind of made this point. He said, we've got, we've got Democrat super PACs, we've got Republican super PACs, so it balances out. There's no real problem here. But um, how many super PACs are dealing with the problem of unemployment? Or how many super PACs are dealing with the question of whether 
um, there's affordable dental care in our society, right? Um, how many people who run super PACs have even ever thought about the idea of not having health care one month to the next? So my point is, the super PACs are operating on the left and the right, but they're worried about a tiny slice of the issues that most Americans care about because they're focused on the sort of things that the sort of people who give to those super PACs care about, and the people who give money to the super PACs are not the average voter. I mean, here's an illustration that I can capture the point. If I asked you, what was the number one issue Congress addressed in, two, in the first quarter of 2011? You know, in the middle of two wars, huge unemployment crisis. Um, we were facing a debt crisis. They were about to shut down the government because of the debt. So at that point, um, what was the number one issue that had the most time on, in, on the floor of Congress and the most time in committees? And the answer is the bank swipe fee controversy. So you don't even know what that is, right? Because you're a normal person, right? So a bank swipe fee controversy is when you use your debit card, how much do the banks collect and how much do the retailers have to pay? Now, why was that the number one issue that Congress addressed? Because I can guarantee you there's not a single congressperson in the history of Congress who ran for Congress because he or she cared about the bank swipe fee controversy. Nobody went to Washington to deal with that problem. That was the number one issue they addressed because that was the number one issue that these large funders cared about. And if you stood on the floor of Congress and you leaned a little bit one way or leaned a little bit the other way, millions of dollars would rain down upon you by the interests that were eager to get your vote one way or the other. So that's where the money is having its effect. It's steering the agenda and the issues in a way that responds to those funders. But it's not steering it in a way that's responding neutrally to what Republicans care about or what Democrats care about. And again, as you think about the particular reforms Republicans want, like tax reform, it's easy to see how you can never get tax reform, I think, until you change the way you fund elections. Because the complexity of the tax system is designed to make it easy to raise money for members of Congress running for Congress. Because the complexity are gifts or burdens in the tax system that then are moments for fundraising to support. And if you care about things on the left, I don't know if that's climate change or financial reform, whatever it is, it's the same dynamic. So the point is, the substantive issues people care about aren't going to be reflected in the system until we change the way we fund elections. And given the way we fund elections, yeah, you have pressure on the right and pressure on the left, but it's not representative of what the people care about. And again, that's the thing that the Princeton study demonstrates. They're responsive not to Republican issues or Democratic issues, they're responsive to elite issues, not to average voter issues. You talk about how there's this voucher system that's been suggested and how there's uh, um, a matching system that's been suggested. But it seems like that's, so oh, thanks. It seems like that's a long way from where we are right now, certainly since we're in this very stagnant system and we have been for such a long time and we're, we're facing decreasing numbers of people coming out to the polls even. So what kinds of things can spur America, in your opinion, towards actuating change and towards those goals. Right, so it seems like we're a far long way away, although the matching fund system, the Sarbanes Government by the People Act, has 170 co-sponsors in the House right now. Um, it takes 218 to pass. Um, so what I think we need is to begin to build the movement towards this kind of reform. So what the Mayday Pact did is we said, we're gonna do this in two steps. In the first election cycle, 2014, we're gonna run in a small number of races, kind of pilot, very diverse range of races, Republican primaries, Democratic primaries, challengers, incumbents, we're gonna, and we're gonna demonstrate that we can move voters on the basis of this issue so that we can calculate how much it would cost in 2016 to win a majority committed to fundamental reform. So in two weeks, tomorrow, We'll have completed all those races, and we will see how we've done, won or lost, or what it actually costs. And, and my bet is that after that's done, we're going to have a bunch of surprises that's going to change the way people in Washington think about 
whether voters care about this issue or not. Because the standard view in Washington is that Americans don't care about the corruption of their government. And I think the reality is Americans care about it, but they don't think there's anything they can do about it. So if we can begin to demonstrate that in fact there's something we can do, we can begin to support candidates who support reform and they turn out to win if you do it in the right way, then that begins to build the kind of movement, the pressure necessary to bring it about. So if we're successful in two weeks, then I think we're going to be in a very strong position to build a much more powerful round in 2016. And if we can build a powerful round in 2016 towards this issue, then uh, I think there's a chance that in 2016 we can get the Congress committed to it. Now, in this story, New Hampshire has a critical role. You know, we did this New Hampshire rebellion. We marched across New Hampshire. Um, we're going to do it again this January, except there's going to be four different routes, all converging in Concord at the same place. Um, the whole objective of the New Hampshire rebellion is to recruit people in New Hampshire to simply ask presidential candidates one question, to simply ask the candidates, what are you going to do to end the system of corruption in Washington? You don't have to have a particular answer. You don't have to insist on a particular answer, but just to force the question onto the agenda. And our calculations are that if we could get just 50,000 people in this state committed to this issue fundamentally, then candidates, you know, as there are going to be like 400 Republicans running for president and maybe four Democrats, um, <laughs> candidates will increasingly begin to track the fact that New Hampshire voters care about this issue. You know, you did once in, 19, in 2000, John McCain won in this state, in part because he made this a central issue of his campaign. I think if you did it again in 2016, this would begin to be a breakout issue, especially in the Republican primary. The Democrats are more united around doing something about this. And if New Hampshire did that, if the candidate in New Hampshire made this a salient issue, that makes it possible to move this issue around the rest of the country. And if New Hampshire doesn't do anything about it, then it's impossible to move this issue around the rest of the country. So this is a critical election. And you are critical players, because basically you're going to be living with these candidates for the next two years. They will be in your house. They will be in your lawn. Um, you'll be meeting them at coffee every single morning. And you have an enormous opportunity to get them to respond to it. And not in a partisan way, but in a genuinely citizen way. Um, one of the most you know, rewarding meetings I had was with um, uh, Doug and Stella Scammon, who are the two leading, Republic they're two leading Republicans. Every Republican candidate seems to announce at their farm. So Romney did, uh, uh, Scott Brown did, uh, George W. Bush did. So they are key Republicans. But that, Doug Scammon said to me, the way you need to get people to think about this is exactly what I said to you. Not a Democratic issue, not a Republican issue, an American issue. If New Hampshire can talk about it like that and get people to think about it like that and get Republican and Democratic candidates to respond to it like that, it will become an American issue. But only if you step up and actually say something and do something about it. One more question. One more question here. So accepting all of your uh, premises here and looking to the cross-partisan challenge, what do you think the best outcome of the coming election would be? Uh, a Senate that's taken over by the Republican Party, so that's all one party and can do more stupid things? Or a continuing divided Congress uh, that leaves cross-partisanship an open possibility. So I think we got to focus on this, not at the party level, but as on the commitment level. Like, where can we get commitments on this issue? Because we're not going to win this issue with Democrats only, and certainly unlikely to win this issue with Republicans only. Um, but I think there's a way to move this issue so that it's open for Republicans to begin to embrace it and it's open for Democrats to continue to rally behind it. So in this election cycle, what we hope happens is that in these races that we're running in, um, we've got one race in South Dakota Senate, we've got a race in 
supporting an independent in Kansas. We're taking on a chairman of the Republic of the um, Energy Committee in the House, a Republican Fred Upton in Michigan. Um, we have an open seat in um, Iowa. We're supporting a Republican in, Nor in North Carolina. Um, we're supporting Kel Shea Porter here in New Hampshire. Um, in this mix of races, all very different. If we can win a substantial num of number of them and show how our issue moved people, we create the kind of support in Washington and outside of Washington to build the much bigger election in, uh, campaign in 2016. And you know, obviously, nobody's talking about this as a national issue right now. But if we take out one or two of these incumbents, I guarantee you this will be a very salient issue talking about it in 2016. I, you know, in Michigan, we've had this wonderful dynamic where we took on Fred Upton, an incumbent. He um, was so angry that we were challenging him. Like three weeks before the election, we announced we were spending one and a half million dollars. Um, he only had a million dollars in the bank, so he was a little bit caught short. Um, on the basis of this issue, because he has not been a reformer and he stopped reform, um, his first reaction was to call all of our large funders. You know, we have 50,000 funders. 75 have given large contributions, but 50,000 have given small contributions. So he started calling our large funders and saying, I can't believe all the things I've done for you, you're now supporting an organization that's opposing me. Now, most people think there's something a little bit fishy about a committee chairman implicitly threatening people because of their political support for an idea. And these people call us and say, I'm in terrible trouble now. And I said, well, why are you in trouble? Because we need him. We need him for our votes on immigration. We need him for, and now he's angry with us and he's going to punish us. And the response is, well, this is why this system's got to change. This is exactly what's wrong with this system. Uh, and the kind of extortion, implicit extortion, that's allowed in the system is a product of big money in the system. So we're using big money to change that big money. Um, but if we're successful, then the dynamic that exists right now will have to change. Um, so um, if Fred Upton loses, um, I guarantee you 2016 will look a lot different. If a couple of these others were able to win, that's going to be very different. But again, the most important thing that can happen between now and 2016 is right here with people like you in this room beginning to say, OK, it's finally time we take this issue up again and do something about it. And if you do, um, I think there's uh, all the chance in the world that we, that we can prevail in 2016. And in the meantime, come walk with us across New Hampshire in January. It's beautiful. I can tell you, it's really beautiful. A little cold, but it's beautiful. <laughs> Lawrence, thank you for inspiring.